Uh, welcome everybody. My name is Sarah Walker. I am the Walden Woods Projects Education Coordinator. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for our Writing Towards Resilience Lyceum. The Walden Woods Project is a nonprofit based out of Lincoln, Massachusetts. We preserve the land, literature, and legacy of Henry David Thoreau to foster an ethic of environmental stewardship and social responsibility. Our organization was founded in 1990 by recording artist Don Henley, and this past April, we celebrated our 30th anniversary. And our program tonight is brought to you by our nonprofit and also UMass Lowell Honors College. Uh, before we start, just to go over some Zoom housekeeping, this is a Zoom webinar, so you are only able to see myself and the panelists. Uh, please use the chat function if you're having any tech difficulties, and I'll do my best to help you out. Uh, you can respond more immediately to other participants with the chat as well. Um, there will be a Q&A, an audience Q&A at the end of the Lyceum, so feel free to enter any questions in the Q&A box. Um, during the, the panel. And now I'm going to introduce our fabulous panelists and moderator. Um, so first up, we have Carolyn Denard. And Carolyn is a Toni Morrison scholar and the founder of the Toni Morrison Society. She has taught courses in American and African American literature for 15 years and has taught and served as a dean at various universities. A leading authority on Morrison, she has contributed to critical anthologies and essay collections on Morrison's work, and she is editor of What Moves at the Margin, selected nonfiction by Toni Morrison, and Toni Morrison Conversations, a collection of interviews. She is currently completing a book-length manuscript entitled Tar Women and Magical Men, Myth and Heroism, and Toni Morrison's Fiction. So, hello, Carolyn. Good evening, good evening, I'm glad to be here. And next up, we have Marlo Miller. Marlo is an artist and a professor of literature and writing. She is a former head of the Faculty Development Council and the Council on Teaching and Learning at UMass Lowell. Miller has conducted faculty workshops on contemplative writing, both locally and nationally. She recently co-edited a special issue of the journal Across the Disciplines dedicated to contemplative writing. Miller has also published a textbook on British literary modernism, as well as articles on undergraduate teaching, Virginia Woolf, and much more. So hello, Marlo. Hello, happy to be here. And our final panelist is Jeffrey Kramer. Jeffrey is the Walden Woods Project's curator of collections and resident thorough scholar. His works include I to Myself, an annotated selection from the journal of Henry D. Thoreau, the Portable Thoreau, Solid Seasons, The Friendship of Henry David Thoreau and Ralph Waldo Emerson, among others. He is a winner of the National Outdoor Book Award and a co-winner of the Boston Authors Club's Julia Howe Special Award. Um, and our moderator this evening is Tom Hersey, and he, is, um, he has taught at UMass Lowell for the last 20 years. He currently teaches English and is teaches in the Honors uh, College. So over to you, Tom. Welcome, everybody. Hello. It's wonderful to be here. I think this is going to be a great deal of fun. Um, I thought before I, I, I started asking questions, I just kind of make a couple comments. Um, I wanted to note that in, in exploring both writing and resilience, uh, we hope to focus on three topics. Number one, we hope to focus on the development of personal resilience in and through the activity of writing and related activities. And I think of uh, something I heard Toni Morrison herself say, she says that art both in its creation and in its reception allows us to be more capable and humane. Uh, number two, we hope to look at this personal resilience with some broader rhetorical concerns, context and readers in mind. And number three, we hope to explore the complex relationship between these two aspects of writing, art, and ethical commitment with the work, methods, and motivations of Henry David Thoreau and Toni Morrison as examples and as teachers. So I thought before um, we started to talk about writing specifically, I thought it might be fun, Jeff, to ask you a question about the Lyceum and Thoreau's day. I um, thought maybe if you could say a few things about, for instance, the, the primary purpose of the Lyceum in the 19th century. Um, and maybe perhaps maybe something about how widespread the events uh, of this kind were, and perhaps maybe even uh, how often they were held. 
Wow, that's quite an opening question, Tom. So, um, um, well, the Lyceum movement started in this country back in around, I think it was around 1828 with Josiah Holbrook. Um, and it was really a form of lecturing and um, public education, adult education, but also entertainment. So not only was it educational lectures, um, but also there were musical venues and um, all sorts of other kinds of entertainment. So it was really a, a very broad spectrum. Um, and it was a slow start by, by the time that Thoreau was around in the mid 1840s and 50s, it was really coming into its forefront. Um, and so there was a Concord Lyceum. Um, they met regularly. I don't think there was an actual specific number of lectures they gave in any particular season. Um, but Thoreau for a while was secretary of the Concord Lyceum and helped gather speakers together and do things like that. And he spoke before the Concord Lyceum many times. Um, by the time of the Civil War, it was really becoming quite prevalent form of um, both education and entertainment for people. And even um, after the war um, was still pretty prevalent for quite a while. So education, was this uh, something comparable to today's kind of um, uh, lifelong learning or was this more uh, kind of geared towards specific uh, communities or um, was everybody invited? Everyone was invited, open to the public. I would consider it somewhat akin to lifelong learning, although they wouldn't have understood that concept perhaps. Right. But yeah, just a way to keep people um, thinking and discussing and keeping sort of uh, some topics in front of, you know, the public eye. Um, just, uh, we're going to talk a little bit more uh, about writing. I'd like to ask you a few questions about Henry uh, in particular. But um, before we do so, just one more question about the Lyceums. Um, I was not aware of how um, maybe entertainment played such a role, um, or maybe I had forgotten that that's the case. Um, it wasn't, it wasn't just, just uh, education, it was entertainment and other things. But um, I'm wondering um, what the, the kind of the, the various roles of writing were maybe surrounding the Lyceum. So for instance, of course there was writing done in preparation for these events, but um, was writing done in response to them? Was there something that was maybe an ongoing conversation in terms of writing? Were these reviewed, for instance? And uh, in keeping with those questions, what was the kind of lasting impact of uh, these um, Lyceum events? Yeah, so, um, I mean, certainly they were they were reviewed. I mean, there were reviews of some of Thoreau's lectures. Um, I mean, I can speak mostly in relation to how Thoreau treated the Lyceum and how Thoreau treated lecturing. Um, and that was as a, as, as a testing ground, basically, as a writer um, before something got redacted into a formal essay that was going to be published in a journal or a newspaper, um, Thoreau was testing that out at the Lyceum so that he could say those words out loud, see how they sounded, and also see how an audience reacted. Um, and then certain discussions, certain lectures might cause a reaction, so somebody else might be lecturing um, from a different viewpoint um, at some point later on. That's interesting. And so I, I, I... I'm interested in the fact that you mentioned there's a kind of a testing going on. And so in some ways, kind of like a lot of the writing at the time with Emerson and, and, um, and Thoreau, um, there was kind of a continuation here, I think, of uh, maybe the modern essay with kind of testing things out, yep. um, trying things, attempting things, and so forth. Yeah. I mean, in the full meaning of the word essay, um, they're, they're testing it out, they're trying it and seeing how it works. And, and some things work, some things did not. And then before they were printed, they would be changed quite a bit. Okay, well, I'm gonna stay with you, Jeff, but I, I would like um, uh, our other esteemed guests to feel free to, to jump in. Um, I, I think it'd be interesting to learn a little bit about Thoreau's writing process and perhaps maybe the evidence or the signs of this process in his finished works. You know, because uh, we've worked together before that I'm very much interested in this. Um, but I'd like to maybe, I think everybody uh, listening would find it very interesting to think about this three-stage writing process. Um, could you say something about that? Yeah, so I mean, for Thoreau as a writer, um, what he did almost on a daily basis for certainly about a decade or a little bit longer was write in his journal, um, which was a sort of a first impression of things he's thinking about, things he's experienced, things he saw. Um, and then at some later point when he's ready to give a lecture, um, he will cull things from all different places in his journal um, and pull them together um, in a like-minded way so that all these disparate thoughts um, actually form together in a pretty cohesive whole. And then, as I said, he tested them out um, on the lecture circuit um, before putting them in, into print. So there was, a, there was quite a staging of you know, putting together, testing it out, 
writing it down. Um, I mean, I'd be curious if Carolyn, if you could talk about how Tony Morrison's writing process worked in relation to something like this, it's probably a completely different process. Um, how did she write? Well, I don't think I've ever heard her say about talk about a three-step process. Um, she says that she always begins with the end in mind. She knows what story's going before she begins. And then, of course, it's the working out of that that um, becomes the, the work of writing. And, um, and I think she also has a um, sort of deep respect for her characters. Of course, she's doing a little differently than Thoreau. She's working from an imaginative uh, realm and giving credence to a world of characters that she herself creates. And of course, she also says that they, <laughs> they have some impact on her as well, the, the characters that she creates. Um, she writes early morning. She says she likes to write and begin writing before the sun, always before the light. So I think for Morrison, it was, a uh, you know, picking up on those uh, aspects of her writing, um, sort of knowing what the end is. She, she had a real sense of what the novel is representing and, um, true respect for the language and having to hear that. And it appears that she could hear that and transcribe that before the, the light comes early in the morning. Um, she's always also says she's a number two pencil writer. I'm not sure, I've started taking notes now with the number two pencil and it's a very freeing thing to have an eraser. So I don't know whether, whether, whether that had something to do with, you know, sort of the freedom to revise. And, and of course she also says that the revision is the delicious part. So I guess if you were going to extract from that, there is this sense of um, knowing the end before she begins um, having a, a deep and abiding respect for the language and a real respect for her place as a conduit of that language. You know, someone able to transcribe it, able to represent the people that she's writing about in the novel. She, she says uh, about so Pilate in Song of Solomon, for example, she says, if Pilate picks up Song of Solomon and reads it, then I'm satisfied. If she puts it down, then you know, I, have, I, haven't, I haven't spoken to the audience that I'm writing for. So um, I think that's a beginning point to kind of understand Morrison's um, intense respect for mood and time and space and language. Yeah, you anticipated some of my questions, Carolyn. So <laughs> this is very good. And I see that Thoreau and, and uh, Morrison have both mornings and pencils in common. Yeah, so, <laughs> that's true. To, yeah. That. yeah, any thoughts, Marlo? Oh, no, I was just drawn to that afternoon in the library um, at the Walden Woods Project and the opportunity to look at a text that Thoreau had uh, begun to manipulate. We had revised, right? And there it was, that that sense of process. And I, I, I don't know if I misremembered, but I had a sense that that was even something clipped and attached. But certainly there was his hand crossing out and writing in. Um, and that's so important when I teach writing for students to have that sense of really manipulating a text and honoring mm -hmm. that delicious process. I love that she that that term of revision being delicious. Oh, yeah. She's calmed me down a, a great bit, having that image in my mind that, you know, now I've gotten to the good part yeah. of, of rewriting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and I think that she, she thought revision was important, not just for writing, but for the other arts, too, in terms of maybe practice and rehearsal and so forth. I, I, I read that about her with workshops that she did. Yeah. Yeah, so that, that's wonderful. Well, one of the things I was thinking about, Jeff, with the, with the three stages is um, I was going to ask you a couple questions about um, uh, civil disobedience or the rights and duties of the individual in relationship to government, and that being an instant of, instance of thorough um, presenting in the Lyceum. Uh, when I think of his three-stage uh, writing process, I think of the kind of field notes out in nature, observations of one kind or another, transcribing that into his journal, working on the journal, and then, as you said, doing different things. And so I always think when I'm reading Walden or something, um, 
Walden or something, as if that's anything like Walden or some of his other works. Um, I always find it very interesting to think about kind of the, the, his importance of perception to him and then maybe reflection later in time. Um, but I was wondering if this writing process uh, was the same across the different genres that he worked with or maybe the different um, um, opportunities that he would have to perhaps maybe give an essay. So um, did his approach to writing vary depending on genre or purpose and what kinds of things would he have done to prepare to, to discuss these ideas on, for instance, civil disobedience in its original form um, at the Lyceum? Yeah, I mean, certainly um, I think his writing process was pretty much the same throughout his life. Um, I don't think he changed it much for any essay or book he was working on. Um, there, there certainly was that sense of, um, which, what's interesting and thorough is that he pulls things from places in his writing or his journal or experiences that you wouldn't expect. So if you look at a book like Walden, for instance, um, it feels like he wrote it while he was at Walden Pond, but he's writing it over a nine year period, only two years of which were at Walden Pond. And most of the things he's pulling from his journal um, to become the book have nothing to do with Walden Pond or living there. And, and I think it's interesting how adept he is or adept he is at, at taking um, very different kinds of ideas from when, from when they originated and then moving them into a place where he can pull them together. So obviously everything sounds like it's taking place at Walden Pond, but he's manipulated that and changed it in a way that it just works as a whole. In some ways, he carries over the experience, though, through this process. He does. Yeah. Okay. I mean, thinking about the experience. So even when he's writing about, you know, Walden um, from a vantage point of six, seven years later, um, it still has to do with it, but it has more to do with um, how he conducted his life rather than the actual living at the pond. And that shows up in, in his um, civil disobedience, too, right? Kind of explaining what he did and why. And why, yeah. Right. Okay, good. Okay, Marlo, I had a couple more questions for you. Um, I, th I think it'd be wonderful to hear about your current approach to teaching sorrow. You just mentioned a few things about what, what you found inspirational at the Walden Woods Project, for instance, the actual cutting and pasting, not in Microsoft Word, but yeah, no, <laughs> in the journal, right? The original uh, digital devices. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and I wanted to kind of get back to that with you about kind of analog versus digital, because I know you give a lot of thinking to that. And it's interesting that one of the reasons why we're, we're here today and it's great that we can be, um, is because of the fact that we um, were interested in writing through difficult periods, um, um, resilience in terms of being able to bounce back. <laughs> um, and here we are um, in our little cubby holes on our, on our computers more than usual <laughs> these days. So I thought that might be interesting too to talk about. But um, so I'd like to talk to you again about your teaching thorough, and especially I think as this relates to writing. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just wanted to go back to civil disobedience, especially since um, it's one of the works that people were able to read in preparation for, for today. Um, throughout his essay, Civil Disobedience, um, Thoreau focuses on the uh, central role of individual conscience. Mm -hmm. I think it's often kind of um, is overlooked when I, when I first talk to people about this. They go to, I think, some of the more obvious aspects of it. But uh, he explores this in relation to each and every one of his major concerns there. So self-reform, self-purification, virtue, duty, education, political life. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering, um, I would like to maybe perhaps discuss these, I guess what you might call exigencies of conscience as they relate to your own pedagogical approach. Um, you're currently exploring Thoreau's approach to writing with your students in great detail. So how might his approach to writing inform their own flourishing as writers? Um, I know you have a strong sense of duty when it comes to these things yourself. You, you, this means a lot to you. Yeah. Um, and how might this relate to their own self-reform and self-purification? We could talk a little bit about how, whether or not self-purification might be a little bit too much in today's kind of uh, yeah. nomenclature. <laughs> to what people talk about writing. Um, but maybe you could talk a little bit about your approach to writing uh, sure. with Thoreau as your guide. Sure, and, and um, Carolyn and Jeff, jump in. Yes. <laughs> um, has, has, there's so much there. I think uh, we can take many paths, but I will start by saying that, you know, I came back to Th Thoreau because my specialty is uh, British modernist literature and uh, the teaching of creative nonfiction writing. So 
um, I came back to him after a time in my life when I had really b become very steeped in contemplative practice and the use of reflective writing as a way of learning and knowing. And I had grown frustrated with higher education. We have a tendency, and it is a tendency, so I'm not saying this is universal, but to think you know, of the human here up. It's, it's all brain, and we're not body, and we're not spirit. And um, I, having spent a lot of time in practice, I was aware of what we were missing. And I want to say that I think my colleagues who teach fiction, creative nonfiction, or creative fiction and creative nonfiction, this hasn't become a separation. There's a body and a mind and they work together. So I wanted to infuse my classes with embodied knowing with the multiple ways of knowing and thorough showed up and he showed up. Thank you, Jeff, between, you know, from you, from Tom, um, from lots of happy discussions and my realization that I could return to him as a local source. Um, so I cultivated a course uh, called Writing and Walking with Henry David Thoreau mm -hmm. for the Honors College. And I've been teaching it now for three or four years. And um, my intent is to focus on those aspects that Thoreau privileges, which is, you know, he can't bear to go a day in terms of spirit and body without walking at least four hours and getting the village out of his mind. When he's in the woods, he needs to be in the woods. So that contemplative awareness of uh, place and self, um, which leads to, of course, as we see in his journal, such deep reflection. I wanted to offer that to my students as writers, as ways of thinking and being. And so the course does a lot of things, but our privilege is on embodied knowing and reflective writing. And Thoreau is our guide and sometimes uh, our frustration and sometimes, you know, all the other things you could imagine when you take someone as a model to, to bounce off of. But you were talking earlier about his process, and this is getting a little away from your question, but we think a lot about his process because it's so iterative, as we've talked about. So students keep journals um, religiously. And from there, they may be cultivating their next piece of writing. But each piece of writing is scaffolded in such a way that they're going back in and digging deeper. So my intention is that they get to have that experience that we're noticing in thorough as we read. And um, we're weaving that in with lots of awareness practices and presence in the world and um, play and a lot of creativity. So in terms of coming back to exigencies, and then I feel like I would you know, love to hear other comments on this, um, I, I wouldn't use self-purification in part because nowadays it implies impure. And while I think the Lord knows we've all got flaws, it's, it doesn't float. Um, but that practice of uh, slowing down, turning off the device, becoming aware and entering into dialogue with oneself and the world, be it um, other species or humans, uh, is so, so valuable as we think about resilience. And we think about a day-by-day -day practice of building community and caring for our souls. And right now, that's, that's what I privilege. And so my seminar has taught me a lot about my other teaching as well. And I'm so grateful for that. And that's, you know, walking with Henry. Carol so or Jeff? It. Yeah. Well, I, I was just thinking, uh, list, when listening to you and thinking how um, Morrison is such a homebody. You know, she's not writing. Um, it, it doesn't take her being um, in, a, in a separate place in nature to do it. It seems to me that uh, she's very interdirected in that way. Um, she talks about the best time being the time before the light comes in, but she also wrote on the subway and she wrote at the traffic lights and she wrote, you know, I mean, she could, she could go to that deep place within um, without having to depend on an external environment, at least in the early, early writing, it seems later that she began to appreciate this, the solace of the, of the early morning. So, um, 
and and you know she wasn't a journal she didn't keep a journal that i know of it's, it's come um it's quite startling that i'm thinking about that now um but she did write so much about herself and her family you know and and how those things became the stuff of her fiction or certainly her worldview and her perspective on her writing and the people that she was writing about so um it seems to me the purifying to Morrison was really inside and deep and not really dependent on nature as it were to, to find that place. Um, that might say something about her being a, a woman, being a working woman, being a black woman, you know, that it's how you have to um, manifest your artistry is um, very different. You know, you're not always in a situation of luxury. And if you want to write, then you have to be resilient. Yeah. <laughs> you have to be resilient against all of these other things that could distract you. And I think that's the thing that's so marvelous and remarkable about Morrison is how she could turn off the distractions no matter where she was. That's interesting. Yeah, I, I like to kind of jump to come with some of those things. Although, Jeff, if you want to jump in, feel free to do so. But I, um, I'm just looking at the clock here. It's flying because of your, your, your insights are so wonderful. Um, but I, I was, I was uh, in preparation for, for this event, Carolyn, I was thinking of um, um, Morrison, whenever I, I've re read some of her, her discussions about these things or watched interviews with her, um, she constantly talked about this profound need she had to write. Mm -hmm. uh, and this pr profound need of writing. And also, I think early on in her writing, how she couldn't write as often as she wanted to. She almost felt guilty about wanting to sit down and write for five hours a day. Um, but what I think is interesting is she started off by uh, saying that she initially wrote in response to loneliness and personal crisis. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, her writing was also an act of love and assertion of, and an assertion of personal sovereignty. Mm -hmm. I just love that. Um, in addition, she claimed that she first wrote for herself, not for anybody else or for publication, describing this activity as an inner dialogue, it's kind of in keeping with what you just mentioned, uh, a way of thinking, a way of feeling, a way of, of life that kind of gave coherence to the world. Mm -hmm. um, you, you kind of just touched upon that. Um, so maybe if you wanted to talk about this personal need, but I also thought it was interesting to think about how long it took for her to to get to the point where she felt like she was a writer. I, I read that she said that she really didn't see herself as a writer uh, proper prior to the completion of Song of Solomon. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, to answer that last question first, I think that's because, well, she really was doing a lot of different things, uh, teaching, editing, raising sons. Um, so just as a practical matter of, of all of the roles that she she was um, that she had saying out loud, which is which seems a kind of um, claiming of your occupation, as it were, that she wasn't ready to say that. And I think, ironically, I think when she she was able to claim that, she says she wrote it on her income tax return. <laughs> that when she was able to claim that, I think that's also the moment at which she, that it was no longer occupation, you know, that it was way of life. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that's, that's good. And that was good for her. And, and of course, we were all the beneficiaries of that. Um, I do think, you know, and I've read those, those um, interviews, too, when she says, you know, it was a way of, um, making sense of her world and and um loving those characters yes. because i think as morrison has says um she's trying to do something that's um very beautiful but also very political and for her that political was affirming the lives of people who had been discredited yes and so you can, you can fall in love with that kind of work, you know, when you know that the, the end game here is to step, tell the story about a life that the world does not think is important. So you can, if you are a true warrior, you can really um, 
want to get into that fight and stay in that fight. And then I think because she was, she was an artist, you know, um, able to write the lyrics and the poems and the essays and the novels, um, that she has such great respect for language. I think she just loved the intensity of it. So here you had um, writing became this moment at which both of those um, passions converged. And I, I can see how you would want very much to take away the clutter and, and just do that. And if you are in, your, and if your life requires that you do all these other things, I don't know how, how she was able to manage it without her head just spinning right off with, you know, having to edit the work. And many people have talked about this, how she was able uh, to edit fiction writers. She was able to edit fiction writers yes. while writing her own work. And, um, and while teaching writing. So it's just a marvelous turn of the brain, you know, where you have to be in so many different um, positions with the work. And, and she was just able to do that, you know, it goes without saying, I mean, she was, she was certainly able to do that in just um, excellent and, and remarkable ways. And, and so I just think that because of her social, cultural position, she just had to manage a lot of things. And so the, the writing really does become resilience for her. It's, it's, it's kind of how she maintains her sanity and, um, and, and brings some coherence to all of those things that she was doing, some personal coherence to that. Yes, uh, Jeff, I'm gonna ask you a question about this in a second in relationship to conscience, go back to civil disobedience. Mm -hmm, yeah. um, but I'm thinking that what, what you're saying, Carolyn, is interesting in terms of um, for, for the, the no place for self-pity, no no room for fear, which we, we put up as a, yeah, yeah, a yeah. sample to read. I, I thought it was interesting, like civil disobedience, it incorporates the story of her own need to overcome personal disappointment mm -hmm. and so forth mm -hmm. in, in it, and then doing the work itself as a kind of an act of that. Yeah. Um, a couple of other things that I think you mentioned here that I think are very interesting, um, which he talks about writing for her characters and writing to her characters and so forth. It, it, there's this really strong sense of kind of interiority, but as you say, it's political. So it's kind of self-mediation, but it's also kind of intermediating with her potential right. readers. And um, I think that that's an interesting thing for us to think about in terms of writing. Um, I love, she says, um, I, I heard her say, um, that freedom does, does not, freedom does not mean that we have no responsibilities, rather true freedom is being able to choose one's own responsibilities. And you said mm -hmm. she had a lot. And I think that that kind of really plays itself out beautifully here. So maybe later on, we, if we have time, we can talk about um, maybe as things changed as she wrote throughout her career, maybe had more freedom, was seen more as a kind of a public figure uh, and a remarkable one at that. Um, maybe we can talk a little bit about how that affected the way that she's, she thought about her responsibilities in this regard. Um, for now, I wanted to ask Jeff uh, a, a question. I'm going to kind of um, stump the expert here. Right? Uh -oh. <laughs> no, I'm not going to stump the expert. I'll never, I, don't, I don't dare try. Um, actually, it's not stumping the expert. I just wanted to kind of run something by you that I've been thinking about for a while. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm very much a, a fan of the, um, the German-American political theorist, uh, Hannah Arendt. I think she's a pretty remarkable woman. Um, and she, res she respected Thoreau a great deal, but uh, however, she did not think that his appeal to individual conscience and civil disobedience was enough to create real change of a political nature. <laughs> she, saw it, she saw it kind of as um, a little bit too subjective. Um, and she was also wary of people saying something out of conscience led to a, a specific action. A lot of this came from her experience uh, um, observing and writing um, famously or infamously, depending on your, your opinion, maybe both on the Eichmann trial and how kind of uh, his conscience had been kind of co-opted by this duty and so forth. And, and I think, you know, Thoreau touches upon these things himself in, in civil disobedience. Um, but she says in her 1970 essay for the New Yorker on civil disobedience that Henry's actions um, as addressed in the essay were noble and very much in keeping with conscientious objection 
but that they were not an example of true civil disobedience. My question for you is, um, how do you view this distinction as it relates to Thoreau? And um, might the fact that he wrote about his experiences and actions place conscience more in line with her thinking about it as being, for instance, a public act, a political act, um, maybe perhaps maybe more than she realized, uh, uh, if I dare say it like that about the great Hannah. Um, in other words, did the writing of the essay itself turn into an act of personal conscientious, did it turn uh, an act of personal conscientious objection into an ideal example of political civil disobedience? That's a big question. I go, I'm wondering what you think about the fact that he wrote about what he did. Yeah, yeah so I mean, it, obviously if you look at um, Thoreau's actions as in not paying his taxes to protest against slavery, uh, sort of a personal protest. It's, it wasn't going to end slavery. It wasn't going to make any real political change. But it was, a, it was a personal protest to say, I can no longer support a government that is allowing for slavery to continue. Um, but when he wrote the essay, he is trying to wake people up to um, answering to a higher law than government to um, answer to their own consciousness and, and say, you know, this is something that is happening that's morally reprehensible and I can no longer abide that. I have to protest. I have to do what I need to do. Thoreau's work, um, he said very clearly at one point, my work is writing. Um, and so that is what he uses to make change. And if you look at it in the 19th century context of when he wrote Civil Disobedience, yeah, it didn't do a darn thing. Um, it just sort of sat there and was unread. But if you look at how people picked it up um, in the 1950s, but particularly in the 1960s, um, you're talking the civil rights movement, you're talking Martin Luther King using that essay, reading it while he's in jail. You're talking about every college student trying to end the war in Vietnam is reading civil disobedience. Every conscientious objector to the war in Vietnam is reading civil disobedience. And when you expand how that essay has um, influenced people around the world, whether you're talking about Gandhi in India or Tolstoy in Russia who was also reading civil disobedience in relation to um, the serfs on his property and how do I deal with this situation. Um, it's, it's incredible to think about the powerful influence of that one essay. Um, and so when you talk about social change and political change or even thought um, and how we can, or how writing can change how people think about things, I mean, that essay is so powerful. I mean, I don't think it's there's practically nothing like it. Mm -hmm. So I think um, she was wrong in sort of um, denigrating the power of Thoreau's essay. I don't know if she was denigrating it, but I think she was, she was afraid that it would be seen as just that act itself is, is um, civil disobedience. But I think that perhaps maybe very quickly, if you spoke to her with the question just asked, she should, should have a great deal of interesting insights. So yeah, um, what well, we're running out of time in terms of what we're doing, because I know we want to leave time for people to ask questions, but I just want to ask maybe uh, Carolyn and Marla a quick question. First, Carolyn, um, what difference do you think um, following Morrison's approach to writing might make in, in the lives of young people today, maybe students that you work with? Um, and, and I guess maybe I'm wondering, do you believe that young writers need to share their work with others um, or might exploring the world to art of some kind or another um, give their world's coherence? And might that be enough <laughs> um, in terms of, of uh, Morrison's example? Yes. Well, I think, um, first of all, I think one, one of the things that Morrison uh, does in terms of the creative writing process is to find out where your creative moment lies, you know, to, to give, to respect that. Now you might find as she did that it's, it's wherever you are, you know, it's um, on the subway or in the park, or it might be in the morning before the sun comes up. And, and some of that gives you permission, you know, some of her, sharing with that gives you permission. Um, it's amazing now how I always thought, well, you know, you don't need to get up too early in the morning, <laughs> right? But of course now I feel like if you don't get up, if you're, if, you're not, if you're not finished with your work before the sun comes up, then it's too late. And so there was a kind of freedom in that to explore my own um, sense of myself as a, as, a, as a writer, in my case, um, nonfiction, but um, but I, I think it also says to young writers that 
you need to try to be in tune with your passion. I mean, um, I like that um, oh, um, writing is what, a, a novel is a hypothetical construction of reality. And it shows you more than reality alone can show. Yeah. And um, I'm quoting, um, help me out. Um, is it? Oh, I don't know. I, I, it's an American sure. studies. American it's beautiful. Study, it's Kenneth Burke or somebody like that. I'm sorry. I, I just, it just slips my mind. But I remember that so much. And so I think young writers need to, to know what, the um, what what is the reality that their work becomes a hypothetical construction of, and so that that means you have to be in tune with your passion and you have to be in tune with the world. You really need to understand history and you need to read other writers. And so, in order to find your lane, you really have to know what's going on around you. And and so there is that kind of pure artistic moment. Of, of giving yourself space and time to tap into that. Mm. But it's also this wider frame of knowledge that you need to have in order to carve out your particular story. You know, unless you're just writing a kind of mirror fiction, you know, just you're writing autobiography. But if you want to say something more about the world and give readers and society a metaphor that can save their lives, then I think you, you, you have to do a lot more work than just writing. You have to read and, and engage and compare and contrast. <laughs> I, I, I love your use of the word permission. Mm -hmm. That's going to stay with me. I th I th that's wonderful. Good. Yeah. Um, very quickly, Marlo, um, what difference might following Thoreau's approach to writing make in the world that your students are currently navigating, confusing as it is? Um, do you believe that your students need to share their work with others in order to flourish both personally and as writers? Yeah, I, so I think Thoreau as a model, as someone to value, appreciate, return, return to again and again, continues to offer new things for any of us as writers. Um, we've talked a little bit about his process and that's uh, that goes on giving. I mean, I've found that. So I think that would be true for student writers. Um, and then in terms of living in this world, I, I just have to come back to his, how adamant he was about simplify, how adamant he was about being present to the world and then to speak up. He didn't shy, though he, he was frank that he didn't really want to stop and have to write about John Brown or civil disobedience. He wanted to be out in the world looking carefully and getting the village out of his head. Mm. But he, he felt strongly that that was valuable. And I think that's something that student writers, particularly student writers, perhaps who want their voice to make a difference and writing becomes their work. He's an excellent model. He's a model for the, the, the attentive screening <laughs> and a model for being attuned. Like he, you can see throughout his journals, he's thinking all the time, well, what does the railroad mean? What does the news mean? What does this mean? What is, and he messes with it. And finally we see a statement of it and a piece of published writing. Um, and he may have gone back and forth a few times. To be able to see that as a young writer is a way to be reminded that someone who's landed in such a way that we're quoting him again and again and again, mm. worked toward that and that, that there's value in that. And then that, that ultimate statement that's published can reverberate for generations. I think that's extremely valuable for young writers to witness, to return to, emulate. Beautiful. So I'm, I went a little over my time. I think four minutes, Sarah. It's okay. <laughs> uh, that was a practice. We can do you. it again. We can do it again if you would like to, to make sure we hit it next time. <laughs> I wouldn't do well on a TED talk. Yeah. No, this, this is awesome. Um, a lot of the questions are overlapping in the chat too. So um, we have a lot of questions in the chat. I'll get to them. Um, folks, Put your questions in the Q&A box. I see some in the chat and I will um, try to bounce back and forth. Um, so the first question for all of you, recognizing that resilience implies an inner strength, what do you as writing teachers or writers suggest as ways to build that strength? 
And we'll start with Marlo and then we'll go to Carolyn and then Jeff. Wow. Um, so, so many things and um, loving kindness <laughs> because every best effort can fail and then we get up again another day and we, we, we get to work. Um, but for me, it's journaling as a way of um, interacting with the world, with self. It's um, going out and witnessing the world in my own time and space and then also in community. Um, like they're, they're two different acts. Um, and then there are a lot of playful things that I find useful as a writer. Um, things like manipulating the text of writers that I really admire as a way of coming to know the text more deeply. Um, making art out of a written text as a way of manipulating and knowing a text. And doing that with my own writing too, is that sort of staying loose. All of that to me, is cultivating resilience, how is getting to that deeper core of resilience is I think comes down to that, that awareness piece. Um, those are some things I feel like I'm, I'm leaving it hollow, but I want to hear from my colleagues. <laughs> well, I, um, I find that I can frame my voice better when I keep reading. And there are some writers that I love to read again and again. And when I'm doing that, I'm, I'm really searching for timing and rhythm and voice. And, um, you know, there are some pages of The Great Gatsby that I can just read over and over and over and over, and over again. You know, or there are pages actually of, of Walden that, you know, or Emerson's Self-Reliance. There are some pages that I just love to read again and again and again. And I like to hear that rhythm in my head. And, um, and it calms me down and it makes me feel like I am one of them and I can face that open page. I can, I, at first it was duplicating that rhythm but I think you get to the point that you find your own. And then the other thing I would say <laughs> is I have learned the value of a good night's sleep. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to, <laughs> I'm sorry to take away, you know, the magic, but um, please don't underestimate what a good night's sleep can give you. If you, in particular, if you wake up in the morning before the sun rises. <laughs> so, that's the Take meaning of life of right there. <laughs> Take care of yourself. Awesome. Jeff? And for, for me, as a, as a writer, um, you know, that sense of what Carolyn was just mentioning about duplication, I mean, it, every writer, I think, starts out in their younger days as trying to imitate somebody they admire. Um, and I know in my early work, um, I'm, I'm imitating poets I loved, I'm imitating essayists I loved. Um, and then you eventually get to that moment when you write the first piece that is you, that is your voice. Mm -hmm. And I remember for me, it didn't happen until I was an adult, until I had a family and I'm writing about family and, and things that are happening about me personally in relation to my wife and my children, that all of a sudden there was the voice. I didn't know, and, and that gives you that confidence to keep going in that direction. Um, but it takes a while to get there um, and it takes that first piece, and you, you don't even know it while you're writing it. It's just when you're done, it's like, there it is, that's me. Um, mm -hmm. That's when you continue as a writer. Yeah. Uh, question for you, Marlo. You mentioned that you see Thoreau as both a guide and also an occasional frustration. Could you elaborate on the frustration aspect and oh, how do you navigate that with students um, and yeah. what students make of Thoreau in general? Yep. So, um, I'll start with the frustration that, that tends to come up is that he's of his time and his language um, is uniquely himself, um, but it is also already dense for us, um, given you know, the, the language that we speak more commonly and, and interact with on the page. So that's a challenge. And then you add in the layer of his uh, his intellect that, that pops around a lot and weaves things in. and um, you know, he's beautiful at, at iteration, a reiteration at, at all kinds of 
rhetorical technique, but there is that circuitous quality. That one of the things that um, we try to do to interrupt that is to take pieces um, out of the longer piece and spend time with them. We can do, I'm sorry, my dog is talking to me, so she's gonna get noisy. Um, we can we can do it analytically, of course, and we all understand, well, let's take this apart. What's he saying? But we can also just do it playfully. We can turn it into poems, take fragments out of it. And in so doing, we find, oh, well, wait, if I decide to do this like a Mad Lib and take out every other word and then add in a word that makes sense to me, I see what he's saying. And sometimes there's a real joy in that, in that once you get it, you don't want to change it again. You're like, oh, no, 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 I like that, right? And sometimes, no, you want, it, you want to simplify it down to the three words out of the 17. Um, <laughs> simplify, and, simplify. That's right. <laughs> um, so in terms of how students um, react to Thoreau, I, I would say it's, it's vast. Some students come uh, having read him far more deeply than I would have done at their age. And um, they, they want to interact at that level. Others, they, they enjoy some parts and would like to leave others. So I, I don't know if I could universalize, but they are there, they enjoy themselves and they engage. That's all I would hope for. Mm -hmm. And next question, um, summarizing some of these questions. Um, so please forgive me some people who are sending commentary as well. Uh, but how exactly do you think we can enact greater change as individuals who may not be writers? Um, That's the question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I read. <laughs> I think um, there there's so much going on right now, and this this younger generation is inundated with so much information. And I think that um, it, it's really worth it to. Um, to be still sometimes and read and try to find out how others, and then I, maybe that's why Civil Disobedience is, was such an inspiring text for people who were really trying to change the world. And, you know, when you're in these classes and you find a text that inspires or you read in journal entries, I mean, I always look forward to getting the Atlantic because I just know that, you know, there's going to be something in there that's going to calm me down and give me another perspective on how I'm looking at the world. So I would say to you um, to try to look for a sustained discourse so that you can um, know the context from which you, you are working. I mean, I could say so much more about that, but I think for now, um, you, you, if you, reading and acting in that order <laughs> mm -hmm. are, are ways to, to also change the world. And I would just add that action, which is that other piece that we could talk about for hours, it is also the piece that builds the resilience mm -hmm. in holding it in and not acting in, in giving into the fear. And I don't mean big glamorous action. I just mean steps to enact mm -hmm. our ethics. Mm -hmm. um, we care for ourselves mm -hmm. and we strengthen ourselves and our community. Um, so the, the action, whether it's writing or contributing in, com in community in some way, it's really healthy for us. <laughs> and right now we need that. <laughs> Anybody else, Jeff, you have anything to say? No. I think everybody's covered it beautifully. <laughs> um, and a question specifically for you, Jeff. Did Thoreau's writings on civil disobedience reach beyond the intellectual community in his lifetime? Were his Lyceum lectures attended by a spectrum of society? So unfortunately, civil disobedience didn't have much effect in his lifetime, didn't reach beyond the people who heard it as a lecture and the very small number of people who read the magazine called the Aesthetic Papers that it was in. Um, so it didn't have far outreaching. Um, but the Lyceums were attended by a vast spectrum of people. So, um, you know, often by, by 
what we call a um, intellectual reading audience um, and as such, but also the farmers. I mean, this is again um, something that was a form of entertainment, and even if it was a lecture on a serious topic, that's still entertainment of, of sorts. And so you would have a very wide spectrum of um, people attending. Um, Thoreau does talk about um, you know giving a lecture and. You have the, the the laborers and the farmers there who are reading their newspapers and you know just having a glorious time, sort of making fun of the speakers. So they're not always there as serious attendees, but overall, it was a very wide range of people who attended. Mm -hmm. And one more question on Thoreau and civil disobedience: um, Did he ever did he not pay his taxes more than once, or um, was his refusal to pay taxes a one-time protest towards the American government? No, so he had, he had stopped paying taxes, I think it was about six years before. So it was about six years of non-payment of taxes. And, and I do just want to point out that he was not the only person making that kind of personal protest. There were other people mm -hmm. in Concord doing the exact same thing. Louisa May Alcott's father, Bronson Alcott. Christopher uh, Freeman. Sorry? Yeah. Christopher Freeman. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so a lot of people were doing the exact same thing. The thing that makes us remember thorough and not the other people is that he wrote about it in just such an incredibly powerful way that made it both sort of personal to him, but also universal so we can all relate to it in one way or another. Um, and we have some writing questions now. Um, someone interested in fiction writing, do you have any important takeaways for fiction in particular? Um, and also someone asks about writing routines. Um, and how if you, like most writers, have a day job, um, how do you kind of handle both of those things? Mm -hmm. um, we'll do Carolyn, Jeff, and then Marlo. Well, I think it is important to just keep trying to find a routine. Um, I've talked to people who have day jobs, as it were, and they write from four to 7 a.m. And then at 7 a.m., you know, they do their other job, they get the children up, they go to work, get ready for school, whatever it is. But for some people, if you have to have a quiet time and you want to have it early in the morning, you have to get up early. And um, others do the opposite of that and they work from, you know, midnight to four, they work from nine to 12 or whatever it is. I think you just have to be deliberate about trying to find the, the, the time that works for you. And then you might be one of those early Morrison people who can write on the subway and write at the ball game and write at the, <laughs> write at the stop sign. But I think that the, the, the important thing that I would want to leave with you is to be deliberate about finding what works for you and, and then embracing it. I mean, for me, um, at, when I started writing seriously, um, I was literally getting up at four in the morning. That is how I did it before my day job. So I could get a couple of hours of solid writing in. And one thing I found was having that limited amount of time. Um, there was something I remember reading that Melville did this. So Melville would lock himself away in his study at Arrowhead. And at noon, um, the, his family was instructed to pound on that door literally until he came out. Um, and he would stop writing. So knowing you have that very limited amount of time, and those of us who have day jobs know that those two hours that we have to write in are very, very precious. It's astounding how much you can accomplish in those two hours because it's very, very concentrated. I would, I would totally reiterate the uh, having a, a time that works and sticking to it. It's, mm -hmm. it's like exercise, it's, it's doing it. But I would also add, because I do so much reflective and journal writing now, that um, having something with you to grab those thoughts, it's not the long-term writing, but you know, little hand notebooks, they're a gem because I can go back and grab those things. And I know thorough practice that, yeah, you know, Morrison it might be scraps did. of paper or not. Morrison did too. Yeah. yeah so post-its. Yes. Okay. So that's my little <laughs> two cents. <laughs> Keep the post-its by your bed. Mm -hmm. and number two pencil. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's when, when Thoreau was affected by John Brown and what was going on, he left um, paper and pencil under his pillow because he couldn't get through the night without having to write more about John Brown. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, 
I wanted to hear more about the dangers of following individual conscience and the way that we can be misused to justify actions based on any strongly held personal belief um, as a critique of Thoreau's ethical stance. Um, you touched on it earlier, um, but if anyone wants to go deeper into that. I mean, I just, I just remember when I first started teaching civil disobedience and how over the years, the power of any individual to cause as much destruction and violence as they can, can do now um, with bombs, with planes, with, you know, all sorts of ways that an individual can cause destruction, that what Thoreau's talking about, if you brought it forth to today's world, which we do, but the people who are causing those destructions believe they are acting by their individual conscience and doing what they believe is the right action. Um, and so it's a, it's a difficult concept to talk about. How do you follow your individual concept if, or conscience if the thing you're following may be, in everybody else's estimation, wrong? Um, and so that's a, that's a really difficult question. And I actually don't have an answer for it, just other than it's been harder to teach civil disobedience as people become more and more powerful in relation to individual destruction. Mm. Yeah, that's tough. Yeah. Question. Um, really great questions, everyone. And for those in the chat who are asking if this is being recorded, it is being recorded. So it'll be a few days until it's up on um, our website. I know there's a lot of teachers who want to share it with their writing students. So um, that's awesome. And thanks for everyone for all the comments too. Um, I'll share them with our panelists because I know they're focused right now on answering the questions. Um, for Jeff and Carolyn, for Morrison and Thoreau, were there major life incidents that led them to um, to have the need to write? Well, I think with Morrison, um, you know, she's always been, <laughs> you know, I mean, she read before anybody in her class. She was just always a kind of smart, precocious, young girl. Um, she did say with the bluest eye though that she had heard um, that they were, they were airlifting um, some Vietnamese um, back uh, to, to the United States, not back, but to the United States. And, and, um, and there was a plane crash and lots of people died and she heard the children died, everybody died. So she said she heard someone say, Oh, that's really tragic, and they were all so beautiful too. And and that you know that somehow because they had fit some standard of beauty, their death was more tragic than anyone else. And so she had heard that, you know, witnessed that, and then she began, you know, really meditates on this whole idea of beauty and. Who, who decides and whose, whose life isn't worth that much and how people are treated as a result. And so that trying to figure all that out and show the impact of that resulted in the blue aside. But I think that there was something deeper in Morrison that, you know, you don't write 12 novels or 11 novels because of one incident. I mean, something that just fundamentally keeps you going and I just think she was just a true artist and was had, had was smart enough and maybe blessed enough to to find what gave her um, satisfaction and clarity and solace early on. And, and for Thoreau, I mean, there really was no specific incident, um, and it's interesting that there's no real indication. Um, from the time he was at Harvard, for instance, that he was going to be a writer or wanted to be a writer. But after graduating from Harvard in a conversation with Ralph Waldo Emerson, who asked Thoreau, do you keep a journal? The next day, Thoreau started keeping a journal and then wrote in it every day for 10, 15 years. So, I mean, that was sort of the impetus to get him going. And I think it just gave him permission to write down his own thoughts. What do I think about this, 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 and this? Let me write it down. And then with the encouragement of somebody like Emerson, who was a mentor to him in the early days, um, putting those ideas together to create a lecture or, or an essay. Mm -hmm. Permission again, right? 
Yeah. Can I ask you a quick question before we move on from that, Jeff? What about the, um, the loss of his brother? Yeah, I mean, certainly the loss of his brother, John, um, which was tragic for him, um, was the impetus for going to Walden Pond so he could write a book about John. Um, and so in some ways, John's death was what led us to um, the book Walden. Um, but, uh, but they're so separate. It's, 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 I wouldn't actually say that John's death created Walden, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, question for you, Marlo, back on writing. Um, how do you help a student who gets so frustrated with their thoughts um, from the mind to paper and um, when they think their writing is not good enough? Um, I feel like there, there's a whole embrace that needs to happen and that writing teachers know well and we all do it a little differently. But for me, and, and that's, this is the challenge in this context, that's when I sit down side by side and we sort of, ideally with someone like that, I might make an, a, an appointment. All right, every week at this time, we're just gonna sit by side, side by side and we'll talk about the text. We'll work on the text together, manipulating it. We might talk about ideas. We might talk about the process of writing anxiety. Um, in some cases, I will share with writers um, comments by a, a writer by the name of Mike Rose, who was an academic writer, but who, who wrote a lot about writing block. Um, but just finding ways to break up that, because um, it's very much a cycle in the brain, right? Of us just, oh no, oh no, oh no. And then this lovely tool and gift we have, which is you know, language and being able to manipulate it on the page um, becomes an enemy. And so I want to break that cycle. And so I'll try anything. And you know, believe me, I'll try a lot of things that'll seem strange and out there, but I want to disrupt that. And I want to do it compassionately. So those are, you know, I would, anybody want to ask me in detail or have a conversation, I'm happy to talk in detail. Mm -hmm. That's the gist of it. Awesome. Um, so we are drawing down on our time. I'm going to ask one last question um, for all of our panelists to answer. And that is, is there a piece of art you continuously turn to for comfort or inspiration? Um, and how beneficial do you see repetition if you do um, practice that? Um, yeah, sorry, I'll give you a moment and then whoever wants to start. I want to just jump in and say I go to Virginia Woolf's um, posthumously published novel Between the Acts. I've written about it a bit and for me there's just something in it and there's something in all of her writing that um, it opens me up, it um, surprises me um, and I, I could list off lots of writers. I just threw up a quote from James Baldwin today because I need him right now. So um, it's always hard to come down to one thing, but I do come back to her book again and again. And there was another part of the question, but I don't remember it, sorry. Repetition. <laughs> right, repetition. Oh, repetition, yes. I think repetition is, I mean, it's all over thorough and I love it. Um, I, I think artists cultivate that and so and we, we see it, but we see it in nuance and variation. And, um, and I think our pattern recognizing brains love it. So, mm -hmm. you know, I love it when it's done in, in a sophistication that surprises me, but I like it when it's simple too. <laughs> I'm all for it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, for me, it's uh, Toni Morrison's Jazz. I, um, I just love that novel. I love the um, ambitious um, quality of it. I love the sound of it. <laughs> I really do. I read it out loud to my students. Um, it, I, you know, it's not one of those um, novels that calms you necessarily. It just is about so much possibility that this is what writing can do. This is what writing can be. It can be like the music. There is a story behind the music, and this is the story, and and it just brings together so many things about the South and migration, and I, I just love taking it all in over and over and over again, and so I just, Toni Morrison's jazz is is the one I can't be without. Mm -hmm. um, for me, strangely, if, I, if I'm going back to something, if I go back to some other author, I find myself wanting to imitate them. So I don't, if I'm 
trying, if I'm feeling lost as a writer, if I go to Thoreau, I start wanting to write like Thoreau. So I try not to do that. So <laughs> actually my answer is I go to jazz, but not Tony Morrison's jazz. So I love music and it helps clear my mind. So yeah, yeah. listen to, you know, kind of blue, I've already listened to it thousands of times. You just put something like that on or Keith Jarrett or somebody where it moves you emotionally, but also helps you just clear your mind and it allows your own thoughts to come in. And mm -hmm. so I don't go to a writer, I go to musicians. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I play the music in my class when I, when I teach. Yeah. I, kind of blue does not age ever. You can, <laughs> it's, it's the first time every time you hear it. Uh -huh. yeah. Chris should go out on that. Yeah. <laughs> if I had only known, I would have played it. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do right after this. Yeah, yes. Barry, you, you can edit it in later on. I know. If only I, if only I had planned this, I could have um, been playing this. Somehow. Intuited. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think that's a great way to end. Um, thank you so much, Jeff, Marlo, Carolyn, um, and Tom, our moderator. Um, and Sarah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I'm um, happy to do it. I think this was a really wonderful conversation. Um, I'll save the chat and share some of the comments with you guys so you can see how much everyone really appreciates this. Um, yeah. And to all much. those, yeah, and to all those out there, um, we hope you'll join us for our next event. Um, we are a nonprofit. We know the pandemic has been challenging. Um, for a lot of people and organizations, if you can contribute anything, um, we would greatly appreciate it. But mostly, um, we're just really thankful for the community. Um, and some of you have been coming to our virtual events from the very beginning. So thank you for the support. Um, and with that, good night, everyone. And we'll see you next time. Thank, thank you. Very much. you. Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs>